All right, it's now time for the Q&A session. If you have a question, you can ask it in the Zoom chat box. And to those who already submitted a question, we see them coming in. And our speakers are going to join us. I have some questions to kick us off. Uh, this is, a, this is the great thing about having a journalism and communications degree is uh, I get to put it to use. I'd love to start with you, Carly. I definitely have been spending more time walking and exploring my city in, in COVID to stay well. Uh, but I still think of nature as the forest or farmland. So why are we so disconnected from even this idea of urban nature? Like, I just think in, until you said it, I, I don't even really appreciate the nature or call it even when it is around me. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I think I think that's it's not just you. That's very true of, of many of us. I mean, even myself, sometimes I find myself thinking like, oh, I'd be really great to get out into nature this weekend. And like, this is what I do. Um, and I think it's because this is the perception we've always been been taught, right? This is in popular culture. This is in movies. This is in advertising that nature is like out there, that wilderness is out there and you absorb those messages. And I think we need we need to do a little bit of reprogramming to start to, to bring that urban nature to the foreground and to show people that these really fascinating interactions you know, between species happen right here at home, happen in our yards. Uh, it needs to be brought into the education system. And just to finish that thought, I mean, it's not, it's not a replacement, right? We shouldn't only have urban nature. We need the big nature too. It's not an either or, it's a, it's a both and. I love that idea of the big nature. <laughs> uh, <laughs> big nature and small nature, exactly. that's how I think about it. <laughs> All sizes. Uh, Joshna, you, you know, you said in your talk, we have to lift our priority of food. And in a way that sounds easy because we all need food and love food, uh, but, but clearly there's something broken. So, so what is it that's, that's keeping the priority down? I mean, I, I have your book here, Take Back the Tray. It's like, who took it from us? <laughs> that's a great question. I love that. Um, and uh, the, there is, what's happening in our public institutions is a reflection of our general priorities, right? It's not an isolated thing. This is in all aspects of our lives, this, this low priority of food exists. And we can point fingers in a number of directions. Uh, governments who make, you know, slashy Bernie budget cuts and sort of force the hands uh, of people. But then there's like the, the food, the big agri-food business machine that sort of met the needs of cash-strapped administrators and said, look at all of this really cheap, uh, awesome food we can make for you. Uh, right. And so like everyone sort of plays on each other um, and we get too distracted with uh, buying phones and shoes and you know what I mean? And other things, uh, right. The, the iPod and smartphone budget had to come from somewhere. Uh, and it's, it feels very clear that the food budget, right. Which is your first flexible, expendable budget line. Cause you have to pay, you can't pay half your rent. You got to pay all your rent. Uh, so food is the first budget line that you can start playing with. Um, and then because you can buy, really cheap things, uh, we start our, our sense of what we should pay for our food really gets distorted. Um, so so a, a number of people have taken this, you know what I mean? It's sort of really fragmented. And one of the things that that signals to me is the fact that we need some, some sort of codified leadership and values about our food in a way that actually protects our food so that this kind of vulnerability doesn't exist as we move forward, right? Our food needs more protection, just like our land and our air and our space. You know, it's all of that in a, in a broader continuum. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Naj, I, I have to say, I'm, I, I'm tickled by your area of expertise, because I think we're all staring at screens all day and, and all night, here we are right now. Uh, but I, I think about the evolution of, of screen addiction. When I was growing up, it was TV everyone was concerned about, and then it, it moved specifically to video games, and then it was the phones and, and the tablets and the apps, and, and now it's, it's Zoom or video chat. Uh, like, how has that, evolved it, you know will it be something else next i think i think with every new technology there is this wave of um, resistance right when uh, gutenberg uh, popularized print a lot of people were afraid of what he was doing uh, you know to 
both to the ability to learn things, but also to the morality of the, of the people. And I think we've been grappling with these technologies of communications. Right now, we are really forced to be in front of these, these, um, these screens. They are, I don't think they're optimal. I think all of us have a sense of discomfort, but, but I think with every technology, there is a double edge, right? If we didn't have this, we wouldn't be here together. I would not have had the opportunity to share my ideas with 400 people. Um, it would have been windy probably if I had to go to one of these lectures, I would have found an excuse to not go. So I think it's a question of moderation, but, but I want to sort of um, also acknowledge that the reality that I think all of us um, ultimately depend on is the food and is the nature in which we exist. Uh, we, we, we live on food and we might be able to entertain and educate um, and sort of relieve some of the um, psychological pain of, of the life that we are living during this COVID, but, but ultimately uh, nature is going to be a refuge. Um, so so that's, that's something to constantly keep in mind while we are sitting in front of these screens. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this whole time definitely makes us rethink and re-examine everything. And, and, and Ravi, we want to bring you in because like space, right? Like we have such a different relationship with space right now. So this idea of the city being a, a theater, like is all space equal or like what makes a good artistic space? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think that um, a, a different artists need different spaces. So a visual artist, a, uh, like a painter or a musician or a dancer or a theater person might need a different space uh, for based on their needs. And I think, I think the thing for me is we know that artists uh, play a role in increasing the value of, of communities and spaces, you know, through gentrification. And so what is a way that we can think about, uh, and gentrification benefits everybody but the artists or every, you know, property primarily. And so how can we think about um, the role that artists can play by benefiting from space and, and what happens or what is the potential of what could happen from encounters in those spaces with kind of general public. I think that's the thing I'm really thinking about is um, how, do we, how do we create the opportunity for artists to identify the kinds of spaces they can use? Because there's such a variety of space that exists out there. So how can we create the mechanism for, uh, just to create those access points and create the openness so that people can access and identify the spaces that are best suited for them? That's great. Okay, we have a lot of audience questions coming in. Um, uh, this one is from Vicky for Carly. Uh, Carly, could you suggest to our audience a naturalist app that you think is best for non-biologists? Sure, yes. Um, there are so many out there, and so it depends a little bit what you want to look at, but a really good general one is called iNaturalist. If you Google iNaturalist, you'll, you'll find it. Um, and that will help you identify pretty much anything you want. You can also contribute to, to citizen or community science projects with your observations, which is very cool. So definitely connecting screens and you know how we can contribute in, in different ways. Our next question is for, from Laura, it's for Doshna. Uh, Laura asks, how does your book help solve the problems you, you mentioned with the current food landscape? Mm, great question, thank you for that. Uh, I, I hope and I think that the book is a really good argument for why we should care about food and why it's worth rethinking our sort of messed up priorities around food. And then it is some really tangible marching orders based on my experience on the ground in institutions trying to make this change. Uh, and so there's things that I have done that do not need to be done again, right? They were very complicated and arduous and there's some objective lessons. And so in the book, I've really used my experience and that connection uh, to try and offer people a bit of a blueprint. I say it's like, here's steps A through C on working this revolution. Do this, because I, I have a sense that'll be pretty similar uh, wherever you go. And then you can figure out what D through Z is gonna look like in your community and in your space. Uh, but this is really, I was just actually looking through the book last night thinking, if I've done anything, it's I've made a really good argument for why we should care and the amazing, really positive ripple of impact 
that can result from a shift in our values and, and therefore a shift in our thinking. And ultimately, I think that's the core of all your talks, right? Is, is like caring about the world around us, but specifically at this time where there is an opportunity to do things differently coming out of COVID. That's it. People are listening and are ready to hear it more than they ever have before. And so I, we would be foolish not to take the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. All right, more questions. Uh, we'll get to these. Uh, this is from Mary for Ravi, uh, who asked, could any of these empty spaces also be used for the homeless? Uh, have, have you discovered anything about that in, in, in your work, in your research? Uh, I haven't uh, gotten that far in the, we, we got stopped by COVID, but again, I think it's really about, um, I really love this idea, especially, and Josh has been bringing it up a lot, values and like how, how do we think about space as a city? I think that's the thing is how do we open up the gates and think about doing things differently based on a different set of values? And so, um, you know, yes, yes to homeless people using the spaces, yes to musicians, yes to all kinds of people. How can we rethink spaces? And, and as Joshna said, like also restaurants, like repurposing kitchens, you know, how can we think about what, what are the um, mutually beneficial outcomes that can result from different ways of thinking about how we use space? That's fundamentally, uh, I think the opportunity now and when, we, when, when people are listening, when we are rethinking values and, when we're in a moment when we, we've seen that we can, we can move things really quickly, like the Canadian government moved so fast in its response to COVID. They activated immediately. They threw a lot of money at the, at the, to solve a lot of problems. And they also, more importantly, they were iterative in the processes of how they tried to figure things out, which is like not how government works. And if they can do it, well, then we absolutely can. I mean, that is, that is, the power of people, as long as we're able to get together and, and iterate process and figure out how we're going on, we just need the access and the resource to be able to take the time to figure it out. Great, thank you. All right, we have a, a question for Naj. This is from Maureen. Senior Calgarian here, Maureen writes, I've become a bit of a webinar junkie since COVID hit. We thank you for that. And I've signed up for as many as three a day. I love these opportunities for lifelong learning. Do you see this as healthy or unhealthy? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, there is a part of me that is organizing these kind of webinars and these kind of activities, uh, especially for um, the more senior um, individuals in the society who are vulnerable to this virus and, uh, and probably should have avoid uh, as much as possible socialization. Um, I, think, I think these kind of interactions, if they are learning and if they're enhancing your well-being, of course, they are not going to be um, stressful. Um, there is a comment from Elaine that I want to sort of um, answer that because it's, it's related. Uh, the content with which we are communicating, the content that we are consuming is, is uh, determining to a great extent whether these are beneficial or not. But the reality is that there is a physical interaction between us and these digital devices. It definitely is going to have an impact on our body if you are sitting in front of the screens and our, on our eyes if you're constantly staring at them. So to keeping a balance between the screen and then taking a walk in the nature, I think uh, uh, that would be that would be the best uh, the best way of finding a balance. Yeah, and I think that's what we're all looking for from our cities, right? In in any time. Is, is, is very much that, that balance. Uh, all right, our next question. This is for Carly, it's from Erica. Do you think a vegetable garden or a pollinator garden in an urban front yard would have more ability to sequester carbon and clean air in a city? So that's a great question. And that's one of the things that, you know, that I'm really focused on in, in my work and many others are, is what are the the co-benefits or the multiple benefits we get by greening our cities. And we know that there are many. So for example, you know, if you plant a tree, if you plant a vegetable garden, you're not just doing one thing. You're not just providing shade or providing space for fall pollinators or food. You're providing many things at once, you know, cleaner air, cleaner water, more carbon sequestration. And so, yes, the, the sh very short answer to your question is, Yes, transforming your yard can do that. And I noticed there, there were a couple more comments that have been kind of flying by here on 
what do we do? You know, what do I plant in my yard? What do I do? How do I help? Um, and the great news is if you have a yard, you can help. Uh, we think of green space and nature as being like parks and, and bigger public spaces, but most of our green space in most cities is privately owned. It's 60% of the trees in Toronto are on private land. You know, this is, this is up to all of us. And one great thing you can do is take some of that land and take it out of grass and do something else. Plant some native plants, plant a vegetable garden. So this is where I'm thinking, you know, Josh and I would love to get your thoughts on, you know, people using the, you know, the, the grass, the yard that they have and, and, and in cities like Toronto and Montreal, it's not a lot, but to plant vegetables, right, to, to grow food, or even you can get a lot. I know more and more apartment and condo buildings and co-ops also have space. Definitely, the growing, uh, we the Toronto Community Garden Network, I'm not sure if they still exist as a body, but they used to do these brilliant workshops telling you how to plant things in old rubber boots and the fact that milk crates are wonderful for strawberry plants because of all the little avenues for the, for the berries to peek out. But even whatever sort of few meters by few meters of a front or backyard in an urban space can generate a lot of food. Right. Let's just even just think about food production, the amount of food that can be generated if you can wrestle it away from the squirrels and the raccoons. Then. <laughs> we do have uh, right? that is a, that is a whole other conversation um, because they're ter like, if, yeah, it's terrible, but uh, you can, in fact, generate a lot of food. And if you're thoughtful about how you grow and you really push organic thinking, you know, and, and don't sort of blanket with um, pesticide spray and that sort of thing, you really can. Right. And. And I think what, what we're hearing, I'm hearing from all of my fellow panelists is this moment really has opportunities for individual action, right? This is not a like, we have to go and start run to Ottawa and lobby the because that's the only way to get something done. It's not, it really is find out how to repurpose your own space. Think about what's happening in your own house, in your own community with your own habits, uh, right? And I like to say all the time with food, the glorious thing about it is that if you get your head straight about it, it is a win, 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 win situation, right? The land gets better taken care of. We get really good food. The environment gets cleaned up a little bit. Communities get a bit stronger because they realize that this guy grows really great zucchinis, but this person makes really great tomatoes and then they swap, right? And that becomes an annual habit, right? And then while they're doing that, uh, they're going to have a meal. And then while they're going to have a meal, someone's going to play some music. Like it just will grow that beautifully, right? At least, I mean, look, my life and my work experience is testament to all of this. I'm sure Ravi would say the same thing. Well, yeah. And, and Ravi, you know, you were speaking about artists, but ultimately for, for artists, it's to bring people together, right? It, it comes back to the audiences. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, audiences, because you, in your talk, mentioned BIPOC artists. So for BIPOC artists, I want to know about the connection and how that's shaping audiences and are we seeing greater diversity in the audiences who are connecting with art? Well, that's the funny thing is right now we can't access audiences. And so a big thing for what we've been, what we at Why Not Theatre have been focusing on primarily is, okay, we can't work with audiences right now. So how do we work with artists and support artists to provide them the opportunities to get stronger now uh, so that when we come back, we're stronger and ready and, and more prepared to take on and, and just be, uh, yeah, have changed the, the how of how the theater is made because we know, or the arts are, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of barriers to black, indigenous and people of color artists. Uh, I mean, this is now, become apparent now for everyone, I hope. Um, and so through mentorship programs, and then again, the, the biggest resource, the biggest asset we need to make work is space. So if we can prioritize black, indigenous and people of color to be able artists, to be able to use that space and activate that space, it's like, it's like training at the gym. You just get stronger, you get better at what you do. And then the hope is when you come back and are presenting work, then the audiences can change and, and your voice will be, uh, 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 be able to resonate with a wider base of audience and hopefully audiences come because they'll see themselves reflected in you. So in this time, let's do the work to make the changes, the harder change, which is let's change the process. And then when we come back, the results can be different. Nobody wants to change process. That's, that's where, that's what we have to use this time to do. And, and where I think a lot of people are talking about is you know, reconnecting to food, reconnecting to nature, reconnecting to a mental health and a spirit, all these things that our busy lives took us away from. And 
So how are we really going to invest in the spiritual kind of examination, the values-based combination com examination so that we are changed and we're better when we come back? Yeah, thank you, Ravi and Brian and Fabi right in chat. A soundtrack for change, uh, both the random music, but also all of your talks. Uh, on that note, we are out of time for questions, but thank you to everyone who submitted questions. It's been a very engaging evening.